Well, good evening, everybody. It's so great to see so many people here. My name is Mina Kim, as uh, George mentioned. I'm the evening news anchor and Friday host of Forum for KQED Public Radio. And I am thrilled to be the moderator for tonight's program with Jonah Goldberg. Jonah is a leading conservative commentator. He's a senior editor at the National Review, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and author of the new book, Suicide of the West, How the Rebirth of Tribalism, Populism, Nationalism, and Identity Politics is Destroying American Democracy. In his book, Jonah says that people on both the right and the left have turned their backs on the principles that uh, have brought humans essentially unprecedented advancement and prosperity, and that if we don't start affirming our democratic and our economic institutions that uh, we run the risk of seeing our democratic system crumble. So we'll give him a chance to explain his ideas further. Please join me again in wel welcoming Jonah Goldberg to the Commonwealth. <laughs> And one of the things that's very clear, Jonah Goldberg, from the very outset of your book is the fact that we lowly humans were even able to get out of the muck of human history, as you call it, is in itself a miracle. Right. Uh, first of all, delighted to be here. Thank you for doing this. Thank you to the Commonwealth Club. Uh, as someone who grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, as a conservative, we were sort of like Christians in ancient Rome. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's nice to be in one of the Western provinces. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, part of the thesis of my book is, or part of what I'm trying to do in the book is get people, not to give a definitive intellectual history or sociological or anthropological history of how we got here, but to get people to just sort of look at where we are and how we got here in a slightly different way and not to take it all for granted. The book is a, I make a power, I would say, I make a powerful plea for gratitude for what we've got. And so the setup of the book is that, first of all, there's no God in the book. That's the first sentence. There is no God in this book. And the reason I say that is not because I'm an atheist, but because um, I'm not trying to make an argument where I just simply appeal to the authority of God. I don't think that's very persuasive to people who don't agree on that authority. And what I'm trying to do in some ways is model behavior I think has slightly been lost on the right these days and actually try to make an argument to persuade people rather than hector people or just be a cheerleader for my own side. So anyway, that said, uh, there's a remarkable consensus among economic historians, um, among anthropologists, about anybody who studies these things, that basically for 250,000 years, human beings everywhere in the world lived on about $3 a day or less. Um, this is the great hockey stick chart of all of human history. Um, ancient Rome, ancient China, doesn't matter where, that was the norm, basically zero economic, close to zero economic growth for the average person. And then once and only once in human history does that start to change, and it only happened in basically one place and at one time. Um, I argue that that's England. Uh, there is a case to be made that it was also Holland, and if there are any Dutch jingoists in the room, <laughs> we, can, we can get to that during the Q&A. And so part of my argument is that why I call it a miracle is not because it's divine, but it, because it's inexplicable. There are lots of theories about why it happened, and I think there are a lot of good theories about why it happened. There's even some merit to some of the Marxist theories about why it happened, <laughs> but there's no consensus on it. No one can agree on why it happened. Well, it's interesting because you say when humans lived on less than $3 a day, but you go even more intense than that by saying that essentially the state of humankind was grinding poverty punctuated by terrible violence and an early death. Right. <laughs> Right, that's right. So, uh, a pretty bleak picture. Well, yeah, no, but it is. I mean, pr pretty much. I mean, so one of the thought experiments I have at the beginning of the book is: imagine you're an alien who only gets to visit planet Earth once every two hundred fifty thousand years, since we split off from the Neanderthals. And um, although it may have been three hundred thousand years, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, on your first visit to monitor Homo sapiens, you would say you'd write in your little journal, you know, semi-hairless apes foraging and fighting for food, right? You come back in 10,000 years, you would say, semi-hairless apes, foraging and fighting for food, no change. Come back in 10,000 years, semi-hairless apes, foraging and fighting for food. You would do this 23 times, and except for some interesting things about migration patterns and whatnot, um, there would basically be almost no progress in human civilization. It would be, you know, if, if the Garden of Eden existed, it was a slum. And then, 
uh, once and, and then also on your 24th visit, you would see some remarkable changes. You would see the first city states. You would see agriculture, which basically creates the first city states. You would see all sorts of new tools and, and, and weapons. Um, and you would see for the first time in human history this, this institution called the home, because we basically had been migratory prior to that. And so you can't wait to come see what comes up in the next 10,000 years. And if you came here 10,000 years later on your 25th visit, uh, you know, your spaceship would probably be picked up by NORAD. Um, <laughs> you might get here in time to see Miley, Miley Cyrus twerking at the Super Bowl. <laughs> and, um, and which is to say almost everything we associate with human progress happened in the last 10,000 years, but that's misleading because it's sort of like me saying that between me and Jeff Bezos, our combined wealth is $130 billion, right? <laughs> Because almost all of the progress that really happened has been in the last 300 years since this miracle. And the, the, the most persuasive explanation for what caused this change comes from uh, an economic historian I'm a big fan of, Deirdre McCloskey, who argues that it was really, it just boils down to words, ideas, rhetoric, the way we talked about ourselves. All a civilization is, is a story we tell ourselves about ourselves. And for the first time in human history, that story changed. I call it the Lockean Revolution, not because John Locke created it, because he symbolized it. And all of a sudden, this idea that our rights come from God, not, than, not from government, that the individual is sovereign, that the fruits of our labors belong to us, um, that innovation is a good thing. For most of Western European history and most of world history, innovation was seen as where we get phrases like upstart. Right? It was seen as a bad and tawdry thing. Commerce was seen as a bad and tawdry thing. And then all of a sudden, this sort of bourgeois revolution in values occurs, and the idea, and, and, and the old sin, what was called curitas, the sin of questioning the established order, recedes in England, and you have the development of markets and, and market principles and property rights and contracts, and out of this, you get an explosion of wealth that has been spreading ever since. Right now, in fact, we live in the greatest moment of material, uh, in the alleviation of material poverty in all of human history. If the trend continues, by 2030, there should actually, there, we may have eliminated extreme poverty all around the world. And we should be at least a little grateful for that. And you give this system that you call a miracle, I mean, all the other things that mm -hmm. you described as well, as liberal democratic capitalism, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I struggle about coming up with a, know, a it, label that really captures the whole thing. I, it does need to be defined, essentially, yeah. because liberal and democratic have such connotations. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I thought about going with the sort of the, the thing from Jerry Maguire and just calling it the Quan, but... Uh, um, <laughs> But it's the whole package. It's, it's, it's economic liberty, it's personal liberty, it's free speech, it's property rights. It's the whole package of this idea that the, that the, the fundamental unit of politics is the individual and that uh, one person with the law on their side um, is more powerful than the mob or the state. So this experience of grinding poverty punctuated by violence and then an uh -huh. early death, right? Capitalism is definitely an improvement upon that. But there are definitely people who would also say that capitalism hasn't eliminated poverty, no, right? Or grinding poverty yeah. even. Or that it's allowed for a system of great income inequality, even maybe our government to be beholden to big business interests and things like that. So do you get challenged on calling capitalism a miracle? Um, I I certainly get challenged on calling it a miracle. I also you get defend yourself. I also get a challenge on calling it a good thing. Um, but <laughs> that so the in a, in a, so it, all of the things that sort of a fair-minded, good faith, progressive person set, claims to care about in terms of politics, um, alleviating poverty, public health, um, alleviating bigotry and racism, and all of these things, um, the miracle has been an unmitigated boon to. Um, Capitalism lowers um, the, the barrier to dealing with strangers. In a state of nature, if you're carrying a, a bushel of apples or something, and I want your apples, the way I get them from you is I hit you over the head with a rock. <laughs> um, in, uh, in capitalism, I give you money, and you give me apples. It's win-win. It's no longer zero-sum. Economics in a state of nature are zero-sum. And the one thing that capitalism is not fantastic about is, uh, is income inequality. Because I would say that capitalism does a fantastic job of alleviating poverty. And how we define poverty keeps 
is a subjective, not an objective thing anymore. You know, you had billionaires, um, you know, the Gettys and the Rockefellers and all of those kinds of guys, if you took their material circumstances outside of how nice their houses were, were much poorer than the average middle class person today. They didn't have Wi-Fi, they didn't have air conditioning. Calvin Coolidge's son, you know, the, most, the son of the most powerful person in the world, arguably, was playing uh, um, tennis on the White House court and he got a blister on his foot and it got infected and he died. Um, the, the advances in medicine and science and technology and all of these things that flow from all of this have been enriching for the average person, not just rich people. But it does create income inequality in the sense that the really rich do get much richer than the really poor who do, in objective terms, still get richer. I mean, I think, I think the global one, you know, we remember all the Occupy Wall Street with the 99% and the 1%. Oh, yeah, speak the, the glo <laughs> um, I've heard rumors. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 global, the global one percent, you know, something like half of Americans are in the global 1%. I mean, I think if you make a household makes something like, I could have the number wrong, but something like $45,000 a year, 1%. they're in the global 1%. And, um, and so, so much of our sense of income inequality has more to do with our human nature in the sense that some people are, are doing unfairly better than us, not that we're not doing well. And that's, and that's a natural human temp temptation. But I guess basically you're saying we've got it pretty good mm -hmm. and that we should be more grateful for what we have. And rather than being grateful and trying to affirm the type of system that we have, that we have resorted to to fighting against it, essentially, to, to taking it down. And, and some of those forces are the ones that are in the very title of your book, right? right. Nationalism, populism, tribalism. So talk about Let's start with tribalism. Talk sure. about why that's such a dangerous thing that you think we need to guard against to ensure the health of our democracy. Right. So I, I should just back up for two seconds and, and say that um, part of the argument in my book is that all of this stuff, liberal democratic capitalism, the rule of law, democracy, is unnatural. Right? If it were natural, it would have appeared in the evolutionary record a little earlier than 250,000 or 300,000 years into the story. Um, and because it is unnatural, there is this natural human desire to rebel against it, to feel like this is not how we're supposed to live. Um, one of my like favorite- within a system that kind of dictates certain- Right, that's, that's, that's sort of my, I have a big argument in there about romanticism and that romanticism emerges as a response to the enlightenment because the enlightenment itself felt inauthentic and unnatural and it, it led to what uh, Max Weber called the disenchantment of the world, that the world just seemed less fulfilling and enriching than, than it once did because we sort of pelted away religion and magic and superstition from the, from the public square. And so part of my argument is that the real threat is um, not from within capitalism, but within human nature. Because tribalism is natural. We were raised, you know, one of my favorite uh, intellectuals was Hannah Arendt, who used to say, Every generation, Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children. <laughs> and, um, and the point here is, is that when anybody who's a parent knows or should know that kids, that, that kids come with a lot of uh, built-in software, right? There is something called human nature, but they desperately need updates um, because uh, when you're born into a civilization, uh, the civilization is what determines what kind of person you're going to be. If you took a baby from you know, San Francisco and you sent it back a thousand years to a Viking village and it got adopted, it would grow up to pillage the English countryside. If you took a baby from a Viking village and you brought it to San Francisco, it would grow up to be a JavaScript writer or like a barista or something like that. Um, we are born into these little civilizations called the family, and the family is what civilizes. Civilization is a process, and it's what, where we learn norms, where parents model behaviors, set expectations about how you're supposed to live, and if the family breaks down and the other institutions of civil society break down, our human nature doesn't turn off, it actually kicks in. And we start, and, our, and it starts whispering at us, trying to give us other things to belong to. And that's what tribalism is. Um, technically, the proper term for it is the coalition instinct, because the coalition instinct is this thing that we all have, it's the subroutine that makes us want to be part of a group. That's how we survived evolutionarily 
um, the, 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 the noble savage who lived alone in the woods died really young. Um, <laughs> Darwin talks about this, about how you need cooperation among a species, among humans, just to pass on your genes. If you've just got one group that is not really cooperative fighting another group that really is cooperative, the one that's really cooperative is going to kill you and it's gonna be more likely to pass on its genes. We are a social animal. Uh, Robert Nisbet, the sociologist, called it the quest for community. We want a sense of belonging, to be part of something. And so tribalism, which in our political context is the word everyone uses these days, but it's really coalition instinct, teaches us, it, it tells us that strangers are to be suspected, to be feared. Um, there's a reigning cliche that says you have to teach kids to hate. This is not true. You have to teach kids not to hate because babies, I mean, Paul Bloom at Yale has, he does these amazing studies. He has a great book called Just Babies, which is just about experiments, psychological experiments with babies. And don't worry, no babies were harmed in the process <laughs> of the book. But um, babies are almost, almost instantly and certainly very quickly become uh, bonded to the sort of the appearance of their parents. They become, uh, they, they cry with different accents. So like Russian babies have a different accent than French babies. Um, they like, they're attracted to their own language from birth because they heard it um, in, the, in utero. And um, so you have to sort of teach kids, they're barbarians when they come to you. You have to teach them not to be barbarians. And um, so part of my argument though is that because civil society is breaking down, what happens is uh, we start um, uh, sort of lining up into these different sort of artificial communities, these abstractions. Identity politics, nationalism is a big one, populism, um, these, these groups that we want to belong to. You have these, these very disturbed kids called incels these days, right? Um, who, because uh, it's very easy to trick the coalition instinct. Um, militaries do it, you know, uh, Marines are taught to, to work together and protect the group. Um, sports teams have it. It's, you don't have to be related to someone to form this coalition instinct. And there's nothing wrong with the coalition instinct if it's properly channeled. There's nothing wrong with tribalism if it's properly channeled. There's nothing wrong with any of these things about human nature if, the, if people are civilized in the proper way. It's when they're not civilized in the proper way that they fall back on these kinds of things. That's why you get street gangs or prison gangs is because we have an innate desire to be with a group to protect our interests, to help us, to um, protect us. Um, it's why you get a lot of things like crony capitalism. It's why you get aristocracy um, is this innate desire to form coalitions to protect your interests against everybody else. So what role then has that played in our current political situation in the election of Donald Trump? And sure. So. How much time do you have? Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, so part of my argument is that you know when we watch entertainment, there's a rational part of our brain that understands it's just a movie or a TV show and all that. Yes. Kinds of, but as Stephen Pinker talks about in a couple of his books, there's a bigger chunk of our brain that doesn't understand it's entertainment. Um, you really go after the movie Dead Poet Society. I do, I do. We can get to that in a bit. But <laughs> the the problem with entertainment. Or the thing is, you know, so like the morality of, of popular entertainment um, is very different than the morality of people who are living in everyday life. Um, we root for the hero to do terrible things to the villain. We, we are encourage violence, right? Uh, I have a long list of movies where the hero of the movie tortures somebody to get information out of them, and the audience cheers it on, right? But we understand in normal life you're not supposed to torture people. And some, um, of, us. some of us, yeah. <laughs> That's different. That's, Tuesday night at, <laughs> at the Commonwealth Club. Um, but, uh, and so one of the things that's happening in our culture is that we are retreating from institutions where we actually deal with real human beings face to face. And we're going on Facebook and we're watching television and we're watching politics as if it's a form of entertainment. And when we do that, you st the tribal mind starts kicking in and saying, it's us versus them. The other are bad, evil people. They're not just wrong, they're evil. Um, one of my favorite cartoons, my wife had it blown up and framed for me. It's from The New Yorker, and it's got two dogs drinking martinis at a bar. And one dog says to the other, you know, it's not good enough that dogs succeed. Cats must also fail. <laughs> and um, 
And that's what's happening to our politics now. I, I can't, it's so many, I have, I, I talk to a lot of young conservatives and I have to tell them that like, something is not justified just because it makes liberals sad. You know, I mean, the argument that it's good for Donald Trump to do X, <coughs> excuse me, solely because liberal tears are delicious is not in and of itself a sufficient argument, right? But that's sort of where we are. I call it in the book, ecstatic schadenfreude. It's this just sort of reveling in the misfortune of others. And that's what you get when you're not actually physically engaged in politics face to face with real human beings, but instead you're just sort of dealing with these sort of demonized avatars who aren't real representations of people. And there's an enormous amount of social science in this where we, th you know, that it's amazing. Today, partisan affiliation is more predictive of attitudes and behaviors than uh, race, ethnicity, or religion in a lot of cases, which is sort of astounding. 40 years ago, if, if I asked you whether you were a Republican or a Democrat, I would have to ask you probably a follow-up question to find out if you were a liberal or a conservative. And what we've had is this giant sorting yes. where um, uh, people are aligning themselves, often in virtual communities rather than real communities, with like-minded people who simply reinforce their, 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 some of their worst instincts and their worst attitudes and their worst bigotries against the other. And I think Donald Trump is, you know, I, I keep trying to tell people this, I, you know, I was a never Trumper, once he was elected, I stopped calling myself that because I thought, for me, the term meant, lost its meaning. I wasn't gonna endorse him, I wasn't gonna vote for him. And I'm not a member of the resistance. Um, I praise Donald Trump when I think he gets things right. I criticize him when I think he gets things wrong, so I end up pissing everybody off. Um, you know, the, the way the resistance argues is sort of like, you know, Donald Trump put salt on his french fries. Hitler put salt on his french fries, right? <laughs> And I keep trying to explain to my left-wing friends, you know, Donald Trump is not Hitler. Hitler could have, re Hitler could have repealed Obamacare. Um, and so he's a, he's a function of a lot, he's a symptom of a lot of our problems, but he's, and he's making some of our problems a lot worse but he's not the cause of them. These things are much more upstream from Washington. Well, part of the reason that you write that he, this ecstatic schadenfreude, this appeal of Donald Trump to certain people, or even the reaction to Donald Trump is so uh, appealing is, is because it's on an emotional level. It's That's almost right. on a gut level for people. Right. And that that has real pull, um, which is why I joked about how you went after Dead Poet Society because you were saying, you know, and there the students were, were not really being taught how to think as much as they were just being taught how to be their authentic selves and to feel, feel, feel. Right, right. no, that's right. And that's what, that's what romanticism is as an intellectual and artistic movement is the sovereignty of feelings, right? And... One of and the, that's played a very powerful role in the 2016 election. Played a very powerful role in the 2016 election. Plays a very powerful role in our lives, in part because um, when you say that your feelings, going with your gut, that the highest source of authenticity is your own emotions, that means you are, that's a very romantic thing, it also means that you're basically giving in to human nature. And the whole point of a civilization is to channel human nature in productive ways. Starts with regulating violence, right? The first civilization said, you know, that's why Max Weber says that um, the state has a monopoly on violence, right? And then as we get more uh, progressive, more evolved, we regulate other parts of human nature. And we now live in a time where, as a matter of just the culture, we are told that the ultimate arbiter of, of truth is my own personal interpretation of truth. And that's, you can get a lot of fake news stuff about that, you can get a lot of you know, distrust of institutions, um, and a lot of it is, it's a feedback, it's a catalytic thing where, you know, there's this great line from Orwell where he says, uh, a man can feel himself a failure and take to drink and become all the more of a failure because he drinks. Um, this is where populism comes from in our culture, where, you know, uh, William Jennings Bryan had this great line where he said, a uh, famous 19th century populist, he said, the people of Nebraska are for free silver, therefore I am for free silver, I will look up the arguments later. And one of the things that I think is so important about enlightenment-based democracies is this idea that arguments should win the day. Arguments, 
marshaling facts and logic and reason and the idea that you can actually persuade people who disagree with you that um, their interests are better served going a different way and instead everyone wears their politics on their sleeves these days on both the left and the right. Well, how does identity politics fit into all of this? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not sure that everyone would agree that all identity politics is created equal. I mean, one of the things that you've talked about in your book is how the identity politics on the left, it's almost as if there was a timeline, right, where it was the left that had a monopoly on it, and now it seeped into the right, right. and that now white Christians, for example, are are declaring themselves an identity group, right? That's right. That's right. And, and, discriminated and, against white group. And, and, and this breaks my heart, right? Because... Um, how to put this? So uh, one of the most radical and amazing things that the Founding Fathers did was abolish titles of nobility. Um, for almost all of human history, what would happen, you know, when our aristocracies first form in ancient civilizations, it wasn't out of this notion of sort of that there were better bloodlines and all of that kind of stuff. That evolved when aristocrats wanted to protect their interests, and they asserted that they were just better human beings, right? Aristotle would argue that some people are just slaves by nature. This is one of the first forms of identity politics, which basically argues, what aristocracy argues, what identity politics argues, is that simply by a virtue of an accident of your birth, some people are better or more deserving than other people. And one of the things that I love about this country, which we have taken 300 years to, and we're still trying to live up to, but one of the best things about the story we tell ourselves about ourselves is that we are supposed to take people as we find them. I am not supposed to walk into a room and see a black person or a gay person and assume that simply because of these characteristics, I know everything there is to know about them. And that's what identity politics is to me. Um, it is not ethnic politics. There's always gonna be ethnic politics. There always has been. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's harmless. But identity politics says that simply because of your membership in an abstract category, a group, um, that uh, there is something that is inherent to your nature about being in that group, that there's a black way of thinking or a gay way of thinking or a female way of thinking that is, um, and that if you violate that, that somehow you're violating either your political allegiances or your real nature. I think you're supposed to take people as you find them. And, um, and so one of the reasons why, Mary Eberstadt had a wonderful piece in the Weekly Standard a few months ago where she talked about how the, the breakdown of the family coincides pretty well with the rise of identity politics. Because again, we have this, this internal desire to be part of something. And the appeal of identity politics is that I can be part of this group. I can get meaning on the cheap from this larger group rather than for something I individually accomplish. But it's not just wanting to be part of something, right? I mean, it's also fighting against something. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you feel like this is a system, right, that operates against you, that it's right. a system that's built to hold up the interests of, say, white male Christians, for sure. example, sure. then you, what you focus on and fight for is very different, say, than what, you know, somebody who is the backlash, as you say, right? Yeah, no, th I think that's a perfectly legitimate point. And, and so what I would argue is that, you know, when the, when the Declaration was written, the, no one really cared about the beginning, right? The beginning was sort of Jefferson on a deadline getting out some, you know, great prose, right? The interesting thing about the Declaration of Independence was the end, independence from, from Britain. It took time for those words, we hold these truths that all men are created equal, to sort of percolate and become held dear by the American people. And the amazing and horrible and evil hypocrisy of slavery is the best example of this. Um, slavery was evil, uh, and the Founding Fathers were obviously hypocrites, not just because of slavery, but also because of their treatment of women and, and, and non-landowners and all of that, and I'm perfectly happy to stipulate that. I think it's important to teach that. But, what, but hypocrisy is this incredibly powerful and important thing because hypocrisy illuminates an ideal. And so when uh, Abraham Lincoln is speaking at Gettysburg, he basically redefines the country. And he says, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers came upon this land with a new idea. And it's this idea that all men are created equal. And all of a sudden, the beginning of the Declaration of Independence um, became the defining feature of our story. And, um, 
And then 100 years after that, you have Martin Luther King coming and say, at, at, in one of the greatest speeches in all of American history, all world history, I would argue, um, saying, appealing to quote unquote white America to their best selves, to their best understanding of themselves, saying that when the founding fathers came here, they wrote a promissory note that all men are entitled, including black men, to uh, inalienable rights and equality. And what he was doing there was appealing to our highest ideals. The argument you get a lot from identity politics today is that, and if you try to say on some college campuses that I want to judge people by the contents of their skin, the contents of their character rather than the color of their skin, those are sort of fighting words. Those are triggering words. Um, because, because people will say you're denying right. my experience as a black person or as a woman. Or That's right. And, and so I think that the 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 what I what I object to, and it's not just on on identity politics grounds, it's also on free speech. There are all sorts of things. Is it's perfectly fine to say that we are not living up to our ideals. I think that's always going to be true in part because that's why we call them ideals. It's another thing to say the ideals themselves are inherently bigoted or illegitimate or oppressive. And I don't think that's true. I, don't th I think they are the greatest ideals that, have been that, have, that we have come up with yet. And, um, and I would argue probably ever about how to organize a society. And so the challenge isn't that everything's perfect. The challenge is to figure out how to create a more perfect union by better implementing those ideals. Well, do you think part of that reaction is because there are people who say, well, we've already gotten there. We live in a post-racial world now. There's equality. People are equal, even though there are myriad examples that we see every day, especially sure. with social media and the advent of cell phone video, that that is not necessarily the case. That, that we are at this point. And so in order to keep making the point that we are not at this place where everybody's experiencing the same level of power and access um, or respect, uh, they are trying to make very clear what's, where the shortcomings still exist. Yeah, I, I, have, I have absolutely no problem. And there's a lot of great sort of bipartisan work being done on things like... Do you agree that that is the case, though, that that... that, we, that uh, we have problems. Yeah, I mean, like, there's, there are problems with police forces. There's problems with the criminal justice system. Um, this Me Too phenomenon, I think, illustrates that there are certainly, you know, <coughs> there's certainly work to be done. But you're saying don't throw out the ideal. Don't throw out the ideal. The ideal, I still think that it is the, one of the great drive moral propositions that you should take people as you find them rather than define them by their groups. And one of the things that truly breaks my heart is that more and more on the right, you're hearing this sort of state of nature argument that says we lost um, the fight against identity politics, so therefore we just have, an, have to have an identity politics of our own. Because conservatives, I would argue, were one of the main forces trying to sort of stay um, uh, loyal to this, sort of these creedal notions about what this country was about. Obviously, there were hypocrites and frauds on the right who were bigots and all that, but that's always going to be the case. But as a matter of rhetoric, conservatives, I think, had the right argument 10 years ago and 20 years ago. And now you find more and more voices out there saying, that stuff is dead. It's, there's this bizarre and creepy Saul Alinsky envy on the right that says, no, no, it's all about power politics, and we just have to help our side, and who cares about these principles? There are all these critics of mine out there who make fun of me for talking about conservative principles. Hmm. And if it then be, and, and so part of the problem is if you have, which you get a lot from the left, which demonizes white people qua white people, that is going to bring about a backlash when all of a sudden white people start defining themselves primarily by their white identity. And then we've just got a war of all against all about identity politics, and that's real tribalism. Well, certainly it's uncomfortable, right, to be viewed by and determined by your race or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that people of color have experienced forever, yeah. right? No, and I think that complaint... And so maybe the hope is that by, by creating that experience, maybe some enlightened people will say, huh, this really sucks. Maybe we shouldn't keep doing it anymore. Yeah, that, that's but a... it sounds like you're saying that we are too, our human nature is too intense that we tend to retreat into, I'm going to defend myself and, and fight you. Uh, and if, if, I, identity politics. If, if I thought we could have sort of a Treaty of Westphalia kind of compromise, right? Yeah. So one of the reasons why we got the idea of religious toleration wasn't because everyone said, oh, we should be nice to other religions. It's that all these different religions in Europe slaughtered each other for 100 years in religious wars, and they got exhausted, and they say, geez, we can't, 
we can't kill them, so we might as well have some sort of truce, right? That is, that is a real uh, problematic thing to hope for as a best case scenario. Um, I would, you know, again, take, take the slavery argument, right? Um, I have absolutely no problem. I want to teach about the evils of slavery and the hypocrisy of slavery. And obviously, the, the tangible evils are greater sins than the hip, just simple hypocrisy. But every civilization since the agricultural revolution had slavery. Um, what is interesting about slavery in Western civilization and in America isn't that we had it, but that we got rid of it. And so I want to teach that we had it to talk about this great story about how we got rid of it. Um, instead, there is this argument, it's very common out there, that says, no, 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 the fact that we had slavery defines what Western civilization is about. And I think that is ahistorical nonsense. Well, let's talk a little bit about, and these, there are a lot of questions here that I think get to this question of, okay, so in your book you talk about how this tribalism also inspired this, this sense of white people feeling uh, attacked, mm -hmm. right? That they were strangers in their own land, um, which was the title of a book by Arlie Hochschild, and that that was part of the backlash that led to the election of Donald Trump, a man who promised that he would basically speak on their behalf again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you disagree with that fundamentally, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the Republican Party, at least the Republicans in Congress, have continue to hold him up, hold yep. up President Trump. And so there are a series of questions here of things that like, how can anyone admit to being a Republican these days? <laughs> Why is the Republican Party and the conservative perspective for the most part abandoned stewardship of the natural world? <laughs> Lots of questions about how you define the right and left now. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you, I mean, what what do you feel like is happening to the Republican Party and how it's defining itself right now? Yeah, so uh, look, this is not an anti-Trump book or a pro-Trump book or no, a book it's about not Trump. Necessarily, but you know, not necessarily. But no, but it, but it was you know when I started it, no one, including Donald Trump, thought he was going to run for president and let never mind win, right? And so I did not plan on trying to write this book amidst a sort of existential crisis of meaning on the right, but it was a. I suppose, a useful exercise, despite <laughs> taking lots of time out to search Amazon for deals on Hemlock. But um, uh, um, I, I, you know, depending on which question uh, we're trying to address here, I should say from the outset, I've never really cared much about calling myself a Republican. Why not? I guess I'm a Republican by default. The Republican Party is the more conservative of the two parties. Hmm. Um, William Rusher, who was the publisher of National Review for 30 years, great guy. He would always tell young staffers, um, politicians will always disappoint you. And he would quote the Bible, put not faith in princes, right? Because, not because politicians are necessarily bad people, though let's admit <laughs> there's a good likelihood that they might be, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, well, then maybe I should reframe the question of what is it like to be a conservative yeah. and a conservative intellectual in the Trump era? It's challenging. <laughs> um, uh, I, you know, and it, it's, it's tough for me because it's, uh, I'm very proud to be affiliated with National Review. These are fights that we have inside of National Review. I think that there are a lot of people, particularly older Americans, older conservatives, who just want to look at the policy victories and say this is great, and they want to sort of put their blinders on and ignore all the costs that come with supporting Donald Trump. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's a reason I have a podcast called The Remnant, which is an allusion to this great essay by Albert J. Nock about, you know, this sort of small, irreducible number of people who hold firm to right thinking on things. And um, I don't mean to be sort of self-pitying or martyred or anything like that, self-martyring, but there is a feeling like that. I think, you know, but one of the, one of the challenges for me is, um, as I said earlier, a big part of my argument about where the miracle comes from just comes from words, about how we talk about ourselves, about how we talk about our country, about how we talk about our principles. And when Donald Trump was running for president and all he would do is talk about how his highest principles, his highest values were, were winning and strength, um, those aren't fundamentally conservative principles, those are Nietzschean principles, right? Um, Fighting for what? Winning what? Um, 
And, and so I think the fact, you know, a lot of people who just say, well, we just, just forget about his tweeting. You know why? That's, a, as a pundit, that's kind of hard to do. Um, but B, I think that stuff has a real cost. And you're seeing this amazing chasm between young conservatives. Ben Shapiro has a very interesting piece in the latest Weekly Standard about this, about how young conservatives, millennials in particular, are, um, uh, they're much more down on Donald Trump than older conservatives are. I think 18 to 24 year old self id conservatives, something like 82% of them want to see Donald Trump primaried. Meanwhile, about 80% of, of older conservatives, older than 65, that's the last thing in the world they want to see. And, it's, and part of Ben's thesis, and I think he's right about this, is that older conservatives have given up thinking about character mattering. And that's a big problem for me because I think I can give you a dozen different definitions of conservatism, um, and I like most of them. But for me, you strip conservatism of its metaphysical ornamentation and its prudential questions and traditional stuff, and you just strip it down to the studs, it boils down to two things. The idea that character matters and the idea that ideas matter. Um, it's very difficult to come up with a definition of character that Donald Trump can clear, um, and of good character. And, it's very, and, it, and his relationship to ideas, I, I would say, is at best instrumental. Um, and, and so that's a problem for me. And so for me, I've fallen back on the safe harbor of I'm just not going to lie. And one of the most painful things for me in the last couple of years is I've lost a lot of fans, I've lost a lot of readers um, who've been very disappointed in me because, as I like to put it, I failed to live down to their expectations. <laughs> and they thought I was going to be a serviceable party hack. Um, I'm not saying that if you support Donald Trump, you're a hack, but there are lots of people I know that including a lot of politicians who say they, one thing when they're in front of a camera and another thing when they're off camera. And I don't think that's part of my job. Well, do you want, do you want to see Donald Trump primaried? Uh, depends who it is, but yeah. <laughs> you yeah. do? Yeah. So you agree with the younger conservatives who see that. What, what about in the midterms? What do you think is going to happen there? Do you think the Republicans are going to lose control of Congress? It started to trend the other way. If you had asked me two months ago, I would have bet large dollars that Democrats take back the House. I think now, um, I would still probably bet that way, but Trump's approval ratings are going up. A lot of <coughs> Republicans are coming home. I still think the energy and the enthusiasm is with Democrats, and I would, I would bet that there's gonna be a blue wave, but it's, it's much less obvious than it was even a couple months ago. So do you think that will be good for the country? Uh, I don't know. Um, um, I, I think I might want to just leave it there. I honestly don't know. I think that you can game this out a lot of different ways. Uh, the, it is very, very possible that the Democrats, if they took back the House, would wildly overreact. And if your position is, you want, if you're from a Democratic perspective and you really want to see a Democrat win in 2020, um, you could game out lots of scenarios where you actually want the Democrats to take back the House because they will go, they will go to impeachment stuff day one and they will lose their minds and, um, and a lot of people will sort of, particularly if the economy steeps, keeps going well and we get some good foreign policy wins, a lot of people saying, you know, you don't want these guys in power. Donald Trump, you know, has turned out to not to be this incredible threat to democracy that people thought he was going to be. Um, and it, it would give Donald Trump a foil to run against. Um, I don't want to get into, I mean, I'm fine with doing the rank punditry, but I don't, um, I, I think part of, again, part of the problems that we have is that why our politics are so terrible are because of larger cultural forces, larger social forces than merely the interplay of partisan hammer and tong stuff. Well, this question, what made you use such an apocalyptic title like Burnham in 1964, who used Suicide of the West, right. and here we are 54 years later, is it because you have no hope, or what then must we do, which is another question sure. from an audience member, to deal with, to ensure that this system that you say needs constant affirmation doesn't disintegrate before right. our very eyes? So, um, on the title, I, I did not anticipate as many sort of diehard James Burnham fans as being <laughs> angry about this as it turned out they were. Even though I, I like James Burnham, he was also senior editor at National Review. It's a, the title's a bit of an homage to, to Burnham. 
the original title and the proposal for this book was called Wealth, because I wanted to write a uh, response to sort of Thomas Piketty's argument. Mm. And, but then it dawned on me one morning that I'm not an economist and that may be not a good idea. And <laughs> I, I wanted to write about some other things as well. And so for a long time, the working title on it was The Tribe of Liberty. Because one, one of the arguments in the book is that most of our cultural attachments to, to liberty and freedom are really an inheritance from the just fundamental weirdness of England. And um, you know, we tend to think that intellectuals create these ideas and then the people adopt them. It actually turns out that a lot of the philosophers are lagging rather than leading indicators, and that Locke was representing a cultural change that was already going on, and then the Founding Fathers sort of purified it. And I wanted to sort of emphasize that it can't just be this sort of rational argument. It's got to be an emotional one that makes us emotionally committed, which is why I think a little nationalism is okay. You're but a pinch a, of salt. A pinch of salt. Of na you know, na uh, nationalism is like salt. Uh, a pinch of it brings out the flavor of the meal, really brings it together. Too much, um, and it ruins the meal way too much, and it literally makes it toxic. And where are we right now? Well, there's some people who are at, in toxic mode. <laughs> I don't think the country is in toxic mode. Okay. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, I think if, if Steve Bannon had had his way, we would be f closer to toxic mode. Um, but, uh, um, and so part of the reason why I picked this title is one, I, 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 I didn't want to write any more books with the word liberal in the title. I think I paid my dues on that <laughs> front. And, um, and I wanted to make an argument that was open to everybody of all parties. And so part of it was sort of a negotiated title with the publisher who still wanted a sort of punch in the nose kind of title. And, I chose Suicide of the West in part because suicide's a choice. Hmm. Um, I didn't, you know, I'm not Oswald Spengler. I didn't say the death of the West or the decline of the West. Just as there's no God in this book, um, there are no cold, immutable forces of history. There's no right side of history. Um, as Ronald Reagan liked to say, we're always just one generation away from tyranny because we do not inherit this stuff in our blood. You have to fight for it in every generation, which gives me, gets me to this solution about gratitude. I think one of the problems we have in this country, and it's a bipartisan problem, even if it's not equally distributed, is that we don't teach gratitude. And the opposite of gratitude is resentment and entitlement. It's this notion that you're just simply entitled to better things, that you don't have to fight for them. We do not have in the Constitution a right to happiness we have an individual right to pursue happiness, which is an important distinction. And uh, so part of my argument is, is that if you don't, that gratitude is the sort of, it's the, it's the method of civilizational upkeep. Um, uh, you know, I have this whole argument in the book about how corruption is a misunderstood concept today. We just, now we tend to think of it as, you know, sort of graft or bribery or something that Michael Cohen does, right? Um, but it actually is a much deeper and richer thing, and it, it gets to the sort of second law of thermal dynamics, which says that um, anything that is not maintained will eventually be reclaimed by nature. In the Bible, the concept of like ashes to ashes and dust to dust captures this. Corruption is this idea that nature always reclaims what is hers. As the Roman poet Horace said, you can chase nature out with a pitchfork, but it'll always come rushing back in. And so if you don't, if you don't tend to the store, if you don't teach people to be grateful for what they've got, human nature kicks in and they start to resent what they have and they take for granted what they have. And so this sort of gets to the, my whole point about teaching people about the bad stuff in order to be grateful for the good stuff. And I think the rhetoric in America is that we, at the educational level, K through 12 and colleges and all the rest, is, is, is to just simply say that our past is nothing to be proud of, that Western civilization is nothing to be proud of, that um, there's nothing here to be grateful for, and a big part of my argument is that uh, basically all forms of tyranny and oppression in the last 300 years are, are, are basically examples of giving in to human nature, of giving in to tribalism. Uh, Nazism was tribalism for one race, fascism was tribalism for one country, communism is tribalism for one class. These are all reactionary ways of basically saying that we're, gonna, we're not gonna respect the ordered liberty of the extended order where, where individuals um, are sovereign and they have inherent rights. Instead, we're gonna see the whole unit as a group and anybody who's outside of the group 
is therefore an enemy. Are you optimistic that we'll get there, that we'll get to the point of gratitude, that we'll get to the point of realization that what we have is something worth fighting for and keeping? Or um, I, you know, is the jury out on that? I, 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 I'll put it this way. The jury's always out. Because again, every generation, sure. the, one, the, the whole point of that Hannah Arendt thing about you know, Western civilization being invaded by barbarians is a very real one. The threat exists in every generation because the threat is, comes from human nature, and human nature doesn't change. That whole thing about the 250,000 years that we fought in little bands against each other, foraging and fighting for food, that is how our brains were formed. And because every generation needs to be taught what our democratic institutions are, what our That's principles right. are, it has they to have so to learn it from scratch. You have to civilize them, because if you don't civilize them, the factory preset kicks in, and the factory preset is human nature, which is which is tribalism and violence and all of these kinds of things. Can and I, that, that, but you have to keep it at bay. Can I ask you what role you think Fox News plays in all of this, whether or not they've contributed to uh, this lack of respect for our democratic principles, our economic principles, our political system? You can ask. No, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so for people who don't know, I'm a Fox News contributor. Um, I will still... Um, pretty passionately defend the stuff that happens on the news side at Fox News. Um, I think Brett Baer and Chris Wallace and those guys do, Shepard Smith, um, they do their level best. There's certainly an argument, though, that they are stoking tribalism that they're stoking. Well, I, 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 again, I would say I'll defend the news guys on the opinion side, <laughs> um, which is what kicks in after 8 o'clock. Um, I'll let them defend themselves. Um, I think that... Uh, you know, you and Sean Hannity are not. Like... We're not buds anymore. <laughs> um, during the election, Sean used to regularly inv uh, denounce me as a member of the Jonah Goldberg class, and uh, which I still haven't quite gotten my mind around. <laughs> um, but it was this it, it, Sean, who's personally a very nice guy. Um, um, he has uh, whole hog bought into this sort of even though he flies private, that he's the voice of the populace, of the people, and that he's right. an everyman. And, um, uh, and so he tries to sort of denounce uh, people who disagree with him as, as elitists, which is a very populist thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't have much patience for it. Um, I will also say, you know, I don't, think, I don't think any of our major media institutions have a lot to be... Um, uh, bragging about about how they talk about politics. I mean, one of the reasons why I think podcasts and these kinds of things are really taking off is I think people are sort of retreating, particularly younger people, retreating from these sort of carnival stalls of screaming at each other that you see, you know, in, on primetime cable news. And um, I think that's probably a healthy sign. There's a, there's a, everywhere I go hmm. in the country, people come up to me and say, um, first of all, sir, please stop eating off my plate. No, people... Um, <laughs> Uh, no, people. People come up to me and say, "Why, um, you know, why can't we have William F. Buckley in firing line anymore?" Mm -hmm. Where William F. Buckley, you know, my colleague Ramesh Panuru, he always likes to say, "You know, my aim is to deal with the left's best arguments, not their worst." And instead, I think a lot of what's happening, because we view this stuff as entertainment rather than sort of information or dialogue, is to hold up the very worst examples of the other side and say, "This is representative of all of them." And, I, and I'll admit, I've been part of that in my life when I thought there was, where again, all poisons are in the dose. I think there's some place for that kind of stuff, but I think that approach is really swamped. Um, a lot of things on the right, which is why, again, I'm trying to sort of model behavior that I think conservatives should follow in, in, in writing the book the way I wrote it. Um, and, but you asked if I'm optimistic about the future. I, I still wanna make a big bet on America. And, um, uh, and I, do I think we have real problems? Yes. Do I think teaching people that assimilation to American culture or that, uh, that, that America is a great place is an important thing, that we're not doing that well enough? Absolutely. But there's also just something, we're also really good at assimilation, maybe not as a government policy, but just as a culture. And um, one of my favorite quotes about America is that, you know, how's it go? America can choke on a gnat, but it can swallow tigers whole. Um, when it's really faced with a true great problem, the times demand leadership and decent people and decent leaders rise to meet that. And I think that that's probably the way to bet in the future. 
But again, a big part of my argument is that you can't, there is no right side of history. There's nothing inevitable about any of this. Every generation, citizens have an obligation to praise good behavior, good arguments, and to condemn bad behavior and bad arguments. And, and to know the difference. And to know the difference. And, um, and that we don't get a lot of right now. And maybe just the poison has to run through the system before we, you know it's over. But it's a real challenge. Well, in the last 15 minutes or so, let's knock out some of these questions from, some great questions from our audience. One person writes, China has lifted the most people out of poverty without rule of law, democracy. Why are they necessary? Yeah. Um, it is true that China has, uh, I'm, I'm very down on China, and I think, and China's a good example of my point about how nothing's inevitable. For a very long time, we were told that technology and markets are inherently liberating and that China would be inevitably on this, you know, this path of development towards democracy. It may well be, but it's not foreordained. It's not an iron law. Um, at the same time, look, China sw switched to markets as a last resort. Dirty, filthy, corrupt, crony capitalist markets, but markets. And when I say a last resort, I really mean as a last resort. First, they killed 60 million of their own people. And they were like, damn, that didn't work. <laughs> and so they started in 1978 with Deng Xiaoping's reforms. They started implementing markets. They allowed people to sort of keep the fruits of their labor, these locking kinds of things. And boom, for the first time in, in in China's history, hundreds of millions of people had electricity, had, had, could eat meat on a regular basis. Literacy goes through the roof. All of these things go up. Um, the statism didn't cause it. The market stuff caused it. Um, hmm. And so uh, do I want China to be a better country than it is? Absolutely. Uh, do I want people to recognize uh, the oppression that in China? You know, if, if China were a nation of, of blonde, blue-eyed uh, Europeans, if, if the Han Chinese were, were, were sort of looked like Swedes, the way they treat minority populations in China would be instantaneously recognizable as Jim Crow on a massive scale. You need internal passports. Uh, ethnic minorities like the Uyghurs cannot get jobs. They cannot get into good schools because they are not Han Chinese. China has enormous problems, but those problems are not created by these market forces. These market forces are the only thing that are making it, giving it, me any hope that they'll follow through on the, on the logic of this stuff. Well, this person wrote, I have started a YAF chapter at my college in the East Bay, and I would like to know what you think the best plan of action to bring the conservative movement to my school is. Um, well, first, sacrifice 50 bulls to Baal. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> <coughs> um, I... Make arguments. Find opportunities to have arguments. Not fights, arguments. I, you know, I've spoken to a lot of college campuses, and um, one of the things I try to impress upon young conservatives is, first of all, just because being a jackass is politically incorrect doesn't mean you should be a jackass. <laughs> and this is something that is lost on a lot of people. They just want to sort of get attention, you know, uh, you know, own the libs and that kind of stuff. And I think that is counterproductive because the assumption, you know, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson has this great line where he says, there's a certain meanness in the argument of conservatives joined by a certain superiority and it's fact. And what he meant by that was that conservatives tend to say inconvenient facts and make arguments that run against sort of groupthink. And so if, if, if you want to have an impact on people and actually try to persuade people, first of all, don't be a jackass. One of the reasons I learned to tell a lot of jokes as a conservative is because when you go on college campuses, there's this assumption that conservatives are just mean people. We need a truckload of brand just to crack a smile. And, um, and I wanted to sort of disabuse people of that. And if, they're, if, they're, if you seem like someone that you want to have a beer with, if you seem like someone who can laugh at themselves and make fun of themselves, it makes it harder to sort of di dismiss you off the bat. But the goal should be persuasion. The goal, go back to Aristotle. That's what politics is supposed to be about, is convincing people that their interests are better served by being members of your coalition than the one they're currently in. And it's not supposed to be performance theater. All that garbage from Milo, 
<laughs> and all those guys um, is so counterproductive. And just because it gets a lot of attention, that doesn't mean it's a success. Well, how would you reframe, and very quickly, how would you reframe how people should approach political correctness then? Because in some ways, part of Milo's whole thing is to, to, to throw a bomb at right. it, right? And, and see the liberals cry, essentially. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how else to really encapsulate the, the strategy. But Yeah, I, again, uh, part of it is to recognize, look, there's a lot in political correctness I despise, right? Uh, a lot of it is a bullying technique by um, left-wing professors and academics and intellectuals to basically police language and to demonize people simply because of a slip of the tongue. But there's also something in political correctness that is simply an effort to come up with good manners in an increasingly diverse society. If people, you know, when African Americans in this country said they no longer wanted to be called Negroes, that is entirely legitimate, right? And it's not, and I'm sure there were old cantankerous people in the 1960s who said, well, that's just the equivalent <laughs> of political correctness, right? But no, treating people with respect and telling, and using the labels that they want for themselves, I think is a sign of respect. One of the amazing, most amazing things about William F. Buckley, who was a very conservative fellow, was also one of the most well-mannered people I knew. And well, good manners, having a light touch, having a sense of humor about yourself um, is a better way to fight political correctness than doing sort of the Milo style performance. You on. mean fight the ills of political correctness, basically? Yeah, I love the aspects of the, it that you. The excesses of it, hate. yeah. Well, this person writes given that conservatives have suffered a shift in jurisprudence toward legislating from the bench, mm -hmm. despite having a 5 4 Supreme Court, um, why wouldn't holding your nose to support Trump be worth two or three more justices? Oh, uh, uh, let me just, uh, the way to respond to that argument, if you're a normal everyday voter or a Republican party official and all that kind of stuff, I completely understand the transactional arguments for Donald Trump, right? If you, if the thing you care about is the Supreme Court or tax cuts or any, or deregulation, those are perfectly acceptable. I may have disagreements with them, but they're perfectly acceptable arguments for saying, these are the things I want from my, pol my political leaders. If they deliver these, I won't care about the rest, right? That's fine. Um, I, and I'm not, I don't mean this in a haughty way, my job is to tell the truth as I see it, right? I think most journalistic ethics are basically this sort of, you know, a lot, there's a lot of BS in it to sort of keep people going to the Columbia Journalism School. But one of the things I actually believe pretty passionately is I'm just not gonna lie. And so one of the things I'm not gonna do is say, I that when Donald Trump talks about a Mexican-American judge, I'm not gonna say that's okay. I'm not gonna do what you hear a lot of people do in Washington, the, you know, a lot of Republicans you know, say, oh, well, the tweeting doesn't matter, and besides, you know, Comrade Trump is gonna bring in the greatest wheat harvest east of the Urals we've ever seen, you know? Um, that's not my job, and I'm not gonna do that. Um, and I don't think other people should tolerate the rhetorical excesses and the things that Donald Trump does either. Um, does that mean that you want Hillary Clinton to be president or, or Elizabeth Warren? Not necessarily. But to be, but I have no party loyalty like that. And I'm not going to sort of bend to that. And when you, and you, and when you get too tunnel visioned about these policy victories, you lose sight of the fact that what Donald Trump is doing to the Republican brand is a very, let's just say a very mixed bag. And we're bringing, the Republican Party is bringing in a lot of sort of blue collar white voters and that's a good thing. It's also increasingly toxic to college educated Republicans, especially women, um, and he's toxic to millennials. And in the long term, that's gonna have consequences too. Well, for someone who really wants us to go beyond our basis instincts, right? Mm -hmm. You really do seem to derive a lot of lessons from your dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you tweet a lot about your dogs. You write articles about your dogs. What is it that uh, that you think you're learning from them, or that people uh, are connecting with? I, I I I don't know how much I'm learning <laughs> from them, but um, you know, one of the things, just to sort of tie it in the book as we wrap up, you know, one of the things um, you I love about dogs is you actually can learn a lot about human nature from dog nature. I mean, dogs um, have certain behaviors that are hardwired into them, and 
you know, they immediately want to form packs. They're, um, they have profound loyalty to each other and to a group. Um, they're also, you know, they're better than humans in a lot of ways. Um, you know, there's that old joke, and I don't mean it in any sort of misogynist way, but there's an old joke about how um, if you want to tell who loves you more, your, um, your wife or your dog, lock them both in a trunk for three hours, and when you open it, see which one's happy to oh see you. Oh, um, my it, it, it works on husbands, <laughs> too. It's the same point, but um, probably just should have said spouse. Um, but the last, the last point I'll make about dogs, which I do, do think ties into sort of conservatism generally, <laughs> is that um, my definition of conservatism is that politics is only supposed to be a small part of our lives. The really important stuff in our lives happens and should happen outside of politics. And when we politicize every jot and tittle of our lifestyles, we invest so much more in politics than we should. And my dogs could not give a rat's ass <laughs> that my book is a bestseller or who the president of the United States is or any of that kind of stuff. And I think that's a wonderful reminder that there are these zones outside of the stuff I do for a living that are actually more important and more rewarding. Faith, family, friends, and community. And yeah, uh, my dingo wins my spaniel. Well, thank you, Jonah Goldberg. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> it's been great to talk with you. Jonah Goldberg. He is senior editor of the National Review and author of the new book, Suicide of the West, How the Rebirth of Tribalism, Populism, Nationalism, and Identity Politics is Destroying American Democracy. He'll be signing books outside the room in just a minute, so make sure you pick one up as you leave. My name is Mina Kim, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.